session, the machine learning session. Then we are going to see a bird's eye view of a GPAW calculation, like from the top. Generally, what are the major uh, steps of a GPAW calculation? Now, the, the, the interesting thing about GPAW is that it's easy to use, it's easy to learn. Once you have it on your computer, you can do reasonably uh, uh, nice DFT calculations uh, on your computer. Uh, if you have a bigger computer, if you have more cores, you can even do larger calculations. But very basic calculations such as, um, you know, the uh, orbitals of a molecule or the uh, optimization of, the, of a molecular structure, uh, we're going to learn how to do these things today. Uh, so today, the basic calculations that we are going to learn, uh, atomization energy, if you have a molecule, uh, how much energy does it take to split the molecule into isolated atoms? You know, we're going to take the very simple example of the hydrogen molecule, H2. And then we're going to uh, obtain the structure of CO2 by uh, molecular, uh, by um, uh, geometric optimization. So these are two different calculations that are done in GPAW. Um, and after that, we're going to deal with a few topics in, in DFT. I'm not going to go into all the possible details, of course, but there are a few topics that are really handy to understand. Um, yes, uh, Simonti, you I, I see here that you're raising your hand. Is there any question? All good? Okay. So, there are a few topics, uh, many, many topics in the DFT is massive, right? It's huge. There are so many things in DFT uh, in terms of the theory, the codes, there are lots of codes that support DFT. Lots of details, lots of intricacies, lots of technical, uh, interesting technical details in DFT. I'll just be covering only two here, uh, two technical details about DFT that are, that actually might, you know, be, um, that are very useful and uh, are, not, are, are also uh, technically accessible, uh, hopefully to the, um, to the audience of this tutorial. Periodic boundary conditions and exchange correlation uh, energy in DFT. Okay, so uh, that's just uh, part two of the series. There's gonna be part three where further DFT topics are going to be covered and then part four. Okay, let's start. Um, yeah, so this slide actually, uh, it's funny. I'm gonna skip it completely. Setting up GPAW. Setting up GPAW, if you have a Mac, you just go to the command line. If you have Python on your Mac, type Python 3 minus M, just copy paste this code, Python 3 minus M pip install GPAW. And once you do that, you, you have your uh, GPAW installed. If you want to run GPAW, then you have to uh, create a directory and install the uh, what what it's called the uh, the uh, pseudo potential files. Uh, I'm actually going to show you how to do this on a Mac. So, uh, one sec. I'm going to go open my terminal. So there's a lot of terminals here. Let's just open one terminal, make it really big. Can you see my terminal, everyone? Can you see this thing that I opened here? Uh, no, I don't think you're sharing that screen yet. Uh, okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna share the desktop. Share. All good. Can you see this uh, thing that I'm sharing? Uh, yeah. On top. Yes. Good. Okay. This is the terminal uh, on Mac, uh, which is the command line corresponds to the command line or the PowerShell on Windows. I'm just gonna show you on Mac and PowerShell should be similar. So Mac, you would go here and then you would do pip three, um, sorry, what's the, where is the thing? Minus M, oh, actually just pip three install Python. Uh, so pip three install, uh, install GPAW, okay? And I do that because I already have it already on my computer. So it says requirement already satisfied. If I don't have it, it is going to go through all the setup steps. And pip is a command that downloads with Python. It's going to automatically download all the required packages for GPAW. 
Now let's say that I want to run my uh, GPAW from a specific directory. So I'm gonna go to my, let's say to my home directory. I'm gonna create, let's say maybe, um, let's say just documents or something, CD documents. And I'm gonna create this make directory. That's the command to make a, create a new directory. And then I'm gonna call it uh, some interesting DFT stuff. And then I'm gonna CD into that directory so that I'm, I'm right now inside some interesting DFT stuff. That's what I'm gonna be doing, some interesting DFT stuff, obviously. And then I'm gonna go and type this command, gpaw install dash data space dot, dot means install it in this present directory. So gpaw install data. And I just need to wait until GPAW goes to the GPAW website in physique.ttu.dk in Denmark. And it's gonna grab all the pseudo potential files. Now what's a pseudo potential by the way? In density functional theory, the, um, uh, the, the, the system is, is always a set of atoms, right? Without going into a lot of details uh, about what, um, the equation that we're gonna be solving is like and all that. Let's just remember that we're each of those atoms is still a quantum mechanical entity. So it has electrons and those electrons exist in orbitals. Now, when you're modeling an atom, like let's say H2, for example, in hydrogen, um, just need to type Y here. Let's say um, a hydrogen molecule, it has two hydrogen atoms. When I'm modeling a hydrogen molecule, the hydrogen molecule is composed of two hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom has one electron in the S, one S orbital, right? So that electron is the, um, you know, is, is the, the valence orbital, the valence electron of this, um, of, this, uh, of this atom. So in DFT, DFT is concerned with atoms that come and bond together right? Uh, it's actually done here. So it, it is, it, it's, it's focused on atoms that bond together. Now, when atoms bond, they bond via their valence electrons. Uh, a pseudo potential is a way to represent the valence electrons and separates the valence electrons from the core electrons of an atom so that it tells the DFT uh, uh, code, hey, um, if it's, for example, let's say carbon. Carbon has four valence electrons and has the two core electrons, right? It's one S2, two S2, two P2. The two S2 and the two P2, they all participate in bonding. So the pseudo potential tells DFT, the DFT codes, hey, only take the valence electrons, the two S2 and the two P2 for um, uh, bonding and keep away the two, the one S2 away from bonding. This is, this is the purpose of, uh, of the pseudo potential. It gives this piece of information to the DFT code. So we're basically adding the potential of the atom, bearing in mind that we're separating the valence from the core. Okay, uh, again, I might have, um, <laughs> got into a little bit of a technical discussion. Um, I'm, go I'm, go I'm gonna try to keep it as less technical as possible, I'm trying to hit the code as quickly as I can. So I'm gonna try to avoid talking a lot of mathematics. But it's important for us to always remember the, you know, that um, uh, DFT codes, they always require a definition for the pseudo potential of each atom. Each code has got its own pseudo potential files. So GPAW, that's what we, we did right now. We downloaded the pseudo potential files for the GPAW. VASP is another software for DFT. It has got its own pseudo potential files. Quantum Espresso is the same. Siesta is the same. All of these are lovely DFT codes. I was, gonna, I was actually planning to show you how Quantum Espresso works uh, uh, because it's one of the very popular and really cool and open source code, uh, DFT codes available in the market but it's harder to set up than uh, GPAW. So I thought, okay, let's just stick to GPAW.
And let's call it GPAL from now on. I mean, GPAW takes more time. Okay, a bird's eye view of a GPAL calculation. A GPAL DFT calculation has two major steps. First, you set up your structure. And this is via the atoms object in Python. So the, there is an atoms object that we will be uh, dealing with. I'm going to show you the code, uh, how to set up the atoms object. It's, it's, this is where we, we say, so this is the box that I am going to uh, put my atoms in. This, these are the atoms, and this is where the atoms are going to be. This is just one step of the whole process. In fact, it's usually the most important step in DFT. Setting up your system makes it or breaks it. If you start from a bad system you know, configuration, you're, start, you're gonna end up with a bad calculation. The next step, so we, we did the atoms, the next step is GPAW, the GPAW. The GPAW is another object, uh, it's a Python object. It receives or, or uses the configurations of the atoms in the atoms object and then does calculations based on that. We can also do further calculations using the GPAL uh, object by creating other calculation objects. So every single calculation in GPAL is represented as a Python object. The first two objects that we, are always ha we always have to build are the atoms object and the GPAL object. Okay. The atoms object. So first, setting up the calculations. That's the first step, as I said. Setting up a GPAL calculation starts from the atoms object. Atom of the atoms object belongs to the ASE uh, software, uh, uh, open source Python code. A lovely, large, collaborative uh, open source uh, code that lets people uh, build systems and run uh, uh, DFT, various DFT codes. Its, its beauty and importance is going to be clearer and clearer as, uh, as you guys start dealing with uh, the FT codes. But for now, uh, just know that it's, uh, it's uh, an open source uh, code that is making available our lovely Atoms object here. So first, uh, that's the Atoms object belongs to ASE. It helps us define the atomic structure and the crystal. So this is where we define the, the box where we put the atoms and we define where the atoms go and what they are. Now, let me show you an example of a code, atoms, you know, a Python code that builds an atoms object. Let's say that we want to place uh, one hydrogen atom at point zero 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 in a crystal of size 10 by 10 by 10. Always remember in GPAW that uh, all the lengths are in angstroms. Let me type this here. All lengths in GPAW are in angstrom. Angstrom. All energies are in EV. It was developed by physicists, and as you all know, physicists uh, love the uh, angstrom uh, uh, EV. You know, um, uh, a pair. Chemists might not be a lot of very EV-ish. <laughs> they prefer uh, many of them. I mean, according to the situation, but a lot of them prefer the uh, joule, uh, kilojoule per mole uh, energy uh, unit for energy. Uh, however, in in GPAO, the unit for energy is always EV. But you can convert EV to whatever you want. So that now this uh, code here, this line of code, atom equal atoms. We put the H. This is the hydrogen, right? Well, once I put H here, GPOW is going to realize, oh, okay, you're dealing with a single hydrogen atom. Next is positions. Positions is an attribute that receives the positions of the atoms that you feed here, right? In the first parameter or the first attribute of atoms. So positions is a set of sets. So here is like a list of, um, in this case, it's a list of tuples, but in the Python jargon, it can be a list of lists a tuple of tuples, a tuple of lists, doesn't matter. Or maybe a, a numpy array even, if you're aware of numpy arrays. Positions equal the set of zero, zero, zero. That's where the H atom is going to be. And excuse me here, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to do just one little thing. 
actually, um, it, should, it shouldn't be 000, it should be 555. I'm gonna explain in a minute why this should be the case. It's actually, I'm glad that I left it. It's one of those good mistakes. It shouldn't be 000. This cell is, um, is uh, this cell is, is going to be 10 by 10 by 10 angstroms. I cannot really put the atom at the corner, right? If I put the atom at the corner, it doesn't really make sense because that cell that I'm building here is, is that's the entire universe for the atom. So this hydrogen atom lives in a universe that is 10 by 10 by 10 angstroms. If I'm gonna put H somewhere, it must be in the center of its universe. It should be like the sun for, the, for its universe, right? So that's why I put five, 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 right? So 10, 10, 10 starts from zero up to 10, zero to 10, zero to 10. Five, five, five obviously puts H in the center of that cell. Let's say I want to put um, a H2 molecule. And I'm, again, I have to correct this. So if I, if I want to put the H2, mol, uh, H2 molecule, it has two H's. One again is going to be, it's going to have to be five minus, I'll say. So in H2, the uh, bond distance is approximately 0 0.7. Half of 0 0.7 is 0 0.35. So you can put it in, if I, if I want to put it in the center of that cell, I'm going to have to do something like this. So five minus 0 0.35, which is half seven, 0 0.7. And then uh, five plus 0 0.35, there's a five here and a five there. How did I miss this? And then crystal size is 10 by 10 by 10 again. So in this case, our uh, atoms code, or uh, the line of code that uh, creates the atoms object is going to um, be H2, sorry, H2 here. And then the positions, as you can see, there are two positions, right? Um, so one of them is uh, five minus 0 0.35. Let's just put this like that. So that's five minus 0 0.35, five, five, five plus 0 0.35, five, five. Basically the center of the cell. And that's it. That's, that's an example of how to use atoms to create um, a system, a very basic systems, right? Now let's move on to a Python file or Python code that I prepared for this uh, tutorial. That's the Python codes. Question, can you guys see it? Well, everyone can see the codes? Yes, we can. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Okay. In order to start using uh, GPAW here, we need to uh, import a few things. We need to import uh, the atoms and we need to import GPAW. These are the two basic objects that we're gonna need in order to run a few calculations. The calculations that we are gonna run now are the atom is the atomization energy of hydrogen. What is the strength of the bond energy of hydrogen, of hydrogen molecule? To do that, let's first, before we, we get into the details, let's just demonstrate how this stuff run, right? So I'm gonna actually copy paste this stuff so first of all, I'm gonna copy paste the import statement into my Python terminal. Don't want this one. Yeah, I prepared this one. Let's just put clear here. Okay, so that's the import statement. It's running, it's fine, it's all good because GPL has been installed. And then this line of code places one H atom at 0.555 in a crystal of size 10, 10, 10, like we said, that's it. So if I put atoms, so the atoms, if I, if I um, ask what atoms is, symbol is H, PBC, we're gonna deal with what PBC is soon, equals false, and then the cell size is 10 by 10 by 10, okay? And then if I wanna create the molecule, that's the code I just showed you on PowerPoint. So you see something, H2 here means H, H. Positions gives the Cartesian coordinate for each atom in H2. In, 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 that's specified by the by the string. So it's gonna be like H, H. So this one is one H and that one is another H. Let's say that this is CO, like carbon monoxide. If I put CO here, the first position is, four, is gonna be for the carbon. 
And the second position is gonna be for the oxygen. And again, cell is 10, 10, 10. Okay. So um, uh, this is a list of tuples. So that's a tuple and that's a tuple, but I can also have, you know, atom, so I can define the molecule using a list of lists. It doesn't matter, it doesn't make a big difference at all. It doesn't make any difference actually with ASE. Uh, if you're aware of the lists and tuples and dictionaries, uh, this is, uh, that's use, useful information here. Okay. We can also obtain a couple of things, a couple of data about the system based on a couple of functions. So let's say I want to get the chemical symbols of atoms from this object. So you can go here, atoms, get the chemical symbols. It's H, H. So it gives me a list of all the chemical symbols uh, uh, in here. Get distance, obviously from atom zero to atom one. That's the first H, that's the second H. Obviously 0 0.7, because that's what we said. It's minus 0 0.35 to five plus 0 0.35, right? So it's actually 0 0.7. And we can get a few other things like initial charges. We start from a zero initial charges, zero for the H and zero for the other H. Initial magnetic moments, we start from also zero, zero, nothing is magnetized uh, in the molecule, by the way. Um, get masses, these are the atomic masses, 1.008, that's the atomic mass, and so on. Okay, get volume, for example, that's the volume of the cell is 1,000 because it's 10 by 10 by 10, right? And okay, now let's start doing some serious stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, so Zoom is only giving us 10 more minutes. Uh, that's bad. So they usually extend the meeting times. I mean, it, uh, whatever, anyway. That's, that's a shame. Okay, to everyone. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you quickly how to um, run um, uh, uh, atomization, uh, uh, atomization energy calculation. So I'm gonna start using variables. It makes it look more uh, pretty. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I will need that, I guess, but it will be hard to manage. I'll, I'll, t I'll do my best. If we could just look back into the same room. I is that possible? I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, because we can reuse the same meeting ID. Um, so we just need to like leave and come back. Uh, you need to you need to go uh, go away and come back to the same meeting room. You mean? Yeah. I I think as a meeting as a whole link is is not going to be any longer valid. I ha I'm going to have to create a new uh, link uh, and then maybe share it somehow. Yeah, I think it's right. Isn't that the case? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, uh, is this? With your personal meeting ID, or is it just a meeting? It's a personal meeting like, so ID, I guess. You were using your personal meeting ID. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm using a personal meeting ID. So yeah. that one is fixable. So you could. Oh, okay. Well, in yeah. that case. So then you could enter and just. Come okay. Back again. Sounds good. I'll do that then. Actually, I, you know what? I'm going to. I'm going to. Okay. Let, let's just keep going and uh, two minutes before I'm going to do that. So I'm running the code now. Uh, so this code here, A is equal to 10. I'm going to use A variable, cell equals A, 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 which is basically just 10, 10, 10. Uh, let me copy paste that code. Okay. Now, um, actually, no, I'm going to start copy pasting from here. So H, I'm going to use a variable H. Uh, indicating a H atom, right? So here I'm creating the, a system for a single H atom, right? It's sitting in the center of the cell. The cell is 10 by 10 by 10. Let's just make sure that I copy pasted all that stuff. Ah, copy paste that. Okay, and then I need to calculate if I'm going if I'm going to calculate the total energy the, to the atomization energy for a hydrogen molecule I need to first calculate the total energy for H2 and then the total energy for a single H and then subtract 
So the total energy of H2 minus two times total energy for a single H. So to do that, first I, create, uh, I run the uh, atom, uh, get the total energy for a single H. So I establish this system. I think I did that already. Second, I need to, once I, now I have the atoms object, remember, I also need to create a GPOW object. Here is the GPOW object. So now I created a GPOW object that is ready to start doing calculations. And I have set that calc object, which is a GPOW object, as the calculator for the hydrogen. Next step is I need to get the total potential energy. That's what I'm after, actually. I need the total potential energy. So E equals H total potential energy. What you guys are seeing right in front of you here is you see how GPOW puts the H in the box. GPOW here is actually doing the, is solving the DFT equations and it's giving me the total energy for a single hydrogen atom. Okay, now uh, they, they, these are, that's the eigenvalues. These are the eigenvalues. It's just one eigenvalue with one occupancy. What is the total energy is E equals H total uh, get potential energy. That's the total energy. Let's print it out. Print E, that's the number. 0 0.02 is pretty, pretty low. And I'm gonna talk about this. It's, it shouldn't be that low. Now let's get the total energy for H2, right? Same thing, H2, we created. Set the calculator as that GPOW calc variable. You see this? That's the calc variable I created here. So we set that as the calculator variable. And then we get the total energy. I'm going to call it E total equals H2 dot get potential energy. Let's do that. So now I'm calculating the total potential energy for the hydrogen molecule, okay, that I created using the same calculation uh, object or the GPAL object uh, for the hydrogen atom. It's now running, keep going, keep going, keep going. There you go. And what is the E total? That's the E total, remember? That's the, gonna store the potential energy for the H2, right? There you go, that's Z minus 0 0.6. Well, okay, so the total, poten the total atomization energy will be that formula. E total minus two times E. E is the potential energy for a single uh, H. E total is for the molecule, but then I get that number. This number is problematic, you know, it, it's too high. The potential energy, the, the atomization energy of hydrogen molecule should be minus 4.5. So we need to fix this. Something is, is not right. To fix this, let's notice something. In the, in the H atom that we started with, the magnetic moment of that H atom, uh, sorry, I started the calculation unnecessarily. Okay, the magnetic moment that I started from in a single H atom was zero but that doesn't really make any sense because the hydrogen atom has a single unpaired electron. Therefore, the magnetic moment cannot really be zero. Oh uh, yes, I actually needed that. You see, when I print out, so H dot get magnetic moments, when I do this, I get array and I get zero for a single hydrogen atom, but the single hydrogen atom does have a magnetic moment. So in order to correct this, I need to fix this in the GPOW object. So I need to set Hund equals true. This is, this is just going to apply Hund's rule and it will make sure that there is an unpaired electron and it will be magnetic. So let's fix this. So we, uh, we, calculate, we, ca we create a new calculation object or a new GPOW object, set the calculator using that new GPOW object and finally do the actual calculation. And let's see what we get here. So it's recalculating now actually. Now, in the meantime, um, I'm going to create a new meeting. Let's just say that this is the first part of part two. <laughs> um, and then I'm gonna stop sharing now. And I'm gonna stop the meeting. I'm gonna create a new meeting. Okay, everyone? Okay, thank you. No worries. Just give me yeah, a thank you. Recording. Uh, yes, sir, Rahul, it is running on my uh, Python laptop. It's a MacBook and it's, it has Python on it. And all of this is running on a, on a no, 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 no supercomputer at this, at this stage.
This, all of this DFT can actually run on a just normal computer. The more complex the system is, uh, okay, uh, Rohit, can you hear me now? So the, the more complex the system is, the more the atoms are, the, um, uh, the more it is, you know, the more you need a larger computer. But if you have a computer, if you have access to like a, a server or a, like a computer with maybe 32 or 48 cores, you can do all the stuff. You can do like uh, reasonably large systems, not really large. Uh, like we use supercomputers with uh, when the number of atoms becomes really large, maybe above 20 or 30, and when the number when the uh, when the accuracy required is also large. What I'm trying to do here is to show you that at least you can teach yourself and you can learn a lot of DFT, doing a lot of DFT just on your computer. Okay, now let's go back to the um, Hun's rule idea. So I said here that we're gonna create a new GPOW object. We're gonna call it calc underscore Hun's rule. Sorry, That's no fine. one can hear. Yep. Yes, Annalisa? Sorry, I think that um, you're muted. I don't think anyone can hear you. Um, okay. Uh, and anyone can hear me or uh, anyone having trouble hearing me? I can hear you. Okay. Annalisa, you having trouble still hearing me? Not anymore, sorry. Oh, okay, beautiful. Okay, so calculate Hundru, that's just a variable I created to, um, you know, that's going to be the new GPAL object enabling the Hund rule. And then let's see how this changes the results. You see here what happened? It was 0 0.02. Now it's minus 0 0.87, blah, blah, blah. It's almost minus 0 0.9. This makes more sense. <clears throat> the total energy for the atom should be a negative number. Initially, when I did it for the hydrogen, remember, it was plus 0 0.02. I mean, it should be zero. I mean, that's just approximately zero, but that doesn't make sense. It should be a negative number. So, um, perfect. So minus 0 0.09, that's a single hydrogen atom. So when I subtract, so let's go back and do the math. Let's see now what, what we get. By the way, I'm going to share this text file here uh, again on the blog, so you can actually download it and, uh, and plug it. So let me just do this here. Now it's minus 4.89, yep. Um, the one, with, yeah, so the default is, uh, doesn't take into consideration Hund's rule. Uh, it sets the total magnetic moment of everything to zero. That's, that's by default. If you enable Hund's rule, it is going to uh, set the, um, the total magnetic moment according to the number of um, unpaired electrons in your system. Uh, and because hydrogen do does indeed have an unpaired electron, if you enable the Hund's rule, it will recognize the uh, unpaired electron and it will set the total magnetic moment to a non-zero uh, value to actually, yeah. Uh, okay, so you see here when I enabled Hund's rule, I got minus 4.89, almost minus 4.9 the correct value is minus 4.5. So we're still off by a little bit, right? So there's still something to be done. Um, uh, uh, Rohit, uh, did I answer your question, by the way? Is it all good? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, no worries. Exactly. No worries. Okay, now let's move on and try to fix this thing. I mean, it's, uh, we need, it's minus 4. Point, actually 9, not 4.8. We need it to be minus 4.5, I mean, close to minus 4.5. This is where we meet with exchange correlation. That's like the big, a big topic in DFT. It's one of the things that determine how accurate a calculation is in DFT, which is a choice, the correct choice of the exchange correlation potential. So I'm going to here just um, uh, dictate, you know, <laughs> based on my experience, uh, an exchange correlation potential that is known to work pretty well. And I'm going to talk a bit more about exchange correlation later in this lecture. So I'm going to use what's known as the PBE exchange correlation. I'm going to actually show you that this paper that is the source of PBE, actually these are the initials of three people, 
The paper was cited on Google Scholar more than 100,000 times. Man, no, that's, that's huge. They are, these guys are stars, you know, 100,000 times, just one paper. Anyway, it was published in Physical Review Letters, 1996. Anyway, so uh, we are gonna set the PBE and let's see how this is gonna affect the calculation. So this is, first of all, we're gonna have to set PBE for every single uh, uh, component in the system for the isolated hydrogen atoms and also for the hydrogen molecule. So, and I'm gonna create this uh, Hund rule with PBE. This variable here is for the GPOW having both Hund rule and XC denotes exchange correlation, just a short for exchange correlation. So these two attributes, I'm gonna set them. Okay, and run this. And then H dot set the calculator to this new GPOW object. And let's start the calculation. So it's now calculating the hydrogen atom total energy using PVE exchange correlation, which is one of, which is a very accurate exchange correlation, and also uh, using the Hund's rule. And by the way, Hund's rule is a setting uh, that is only done for uh, single atoms. It's not done for molecules, by the way. It's a setting that's only particular, particularly done in GPOW in the GPOW object when you're uh, setting up a single atom calculation. Remember this. So when you're setting, when you're calculating a CO2, for example, uh, you don't use Hund's uh, Hund equal anything. It, it's not going to work. It's actually going to give you an error. So that's it, we've got our hydrogen. What's E then? I'm gonna tap E. E is minus, now you see it's more negative. It was minus 0 0.9 almost, now it's minus 1.09, right? That's the total energy of a single hydrogen atom. Now what about, for, so for the, uh, for the hydrogen molecule, I'm gonna create another uh, GPOW object. Here it is. And I'm gonna set this to, to be the calculator for H2. And next thing is I'm gonna calculate the total energy with, with the PBE for the hydrogen molecule. Let's just wait a few seconds or maybe a minute. Do you see those two hydrogens here standing next to each other in this beautiful box? That's one of the things I like about GPOW. Uh, it just represents the, the, the molecular structure in this lovely uh, shape here. Uh, and also to be 100% sure, everybody sees my screen, right? That I'm sharing. Right? I hope you guys yes. do. Perfect, thanks. Now let's calculate the energy. It's minus 4.53 at last, we're getting a reasonable number. So that number is, uh, uh, is very close to the experimental number, minus 4.5 EV, which is actually the amount of energy it takes to split a hydrogen molecule. Now next, the next tutorial is going to be I mean, not next to the next slide is about the structure of CO2. That's a different problem. So the previous problem was for a given structure, what is the total energy? Now it's here for a given structure, what is the correct structure? And this is one of the most common and the most important DFT calculations ever. This is the optimization, geometry optimization. So let's, let's just move on to the basic calculations underscore two Python file. Uh, again, this one is also going to be uh, on my vlog. Let's see uh, what's happening here. So this is an optimization calculation. After I create my GPOW object, I'm going to need to create another object that is going to be concerned with the optimization. Let's just take it step by step. So again, it's a supercell or a, a, a simulation cell that is 10 by 10 by 10. A, 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 A is equal to 10 here. I'm going to assume that the carbon is sitting in the center. So CO2, right? So C, O, O. So that's C, that's O, and that's O. So the C is in the center. One oxygen is D away from the center along the x-axis. The other is on the other side of the x-axis, D away. What's D? It's one angstrom. So I'm starting with a CO2 that has a wrong structure. CO2, the CO bond, the double bond, is not one angstrom big or long. It's one point something, right? Let's determine using uh, GPAO what that something is. And guess what? It is only those few lines of code that are needed to determine that. 
So I'm gonna copy paste that stuff up to here. By the way, you notice these stuff that start with the hash, that's just a comment. It's not gonna be executed, executed by Python, just to, for me to explain what's going on. So there you go. So I created the system here. So CO2 uh, is created, the structure. The GPOW calculator is just simply with the PVE exchange correlation. I set that calculator to the CO2 system or the atoms object. And then quasi-Newton is one of the algorithms that do geometry optimization. There are many others in GPOW. And actually this is not belonging to GPOW, it's belonging to ASE. You guys remember the ASE that I discussed before? So ASE comes up with the, these beautiful optimization algorithms, has many of them. This is one of them. I'm just gonna be using it, it's very simple. And let me just create the uh, quasi-Newton object. Okay and setting it up good so it's going to be running uh, um, uh, it's going to start running the uh, quasi newton uh, calculation here uh, it's going to create the relaxation object which is based on the um, um, second it's just gonna be doing one calculation, a single point without any optimization at this stage. Once I go relax.run, this is where relaxation is gonna start. And by the way, it's gonna take a little bit of time. So when I do this, this is going to take at least five minutes and because it's gonna take, oh. Okay, I'm just uh, admitting uh, Simonti. So, um, so, Sorry, Simonti, uh, I just saw you here in the, in the waiting room. Apologies for the delay in ad, uh, hitting admit. So um, uh, all of this is recorded anyway, if you've missed anything. So now, you, as you can see here, uh, uh, GPOW is trying to push and pull and trying to move each of those atoms such that the force on each of the atoms becomes very small. There's actually a threshold that I am setting here. The threshold should be keep moving the atoms until the forces on each atom, maximum force on each atom is 0 0.05 uh, EV uh, electron volt per angstrom. So the force, in, the force uh, units or the units of force in DFT is, you know, force is energy per distance. So it's uh, EV, that's the energy per uh, angstrom, that's the distance. That value here in the DFT uh, tradition is, is small, but uh, it's not very small. We can do better. I mean, the force max is typically 0 0.01. If it's a molecule, it could be 0 0.01 or even less. But if it's a crystal structure, if it's a large crystal structure, we can do with 0 0.02, 0 0.03. Uh, I put 0 0.05 so that it just finishes quickly. We don't wait for ages until it finishes. And once this calculation is gonna finish, we're gonna retrieve the distance between the first and the second atoms, that's carbon and the oxygen. And we're gonna find out what that distance is. Uh, uh, it's okay, Ali, uh, Ali Reza, that's fine, man. I'll, I'll see you in a, in a future meeting. Okay, you, see, you, you can see here that it's still running. It's still trying to optimize uh, the, the structure. Um, yeah, so this is the optimization code running. Once it finishes, I'm gonna run this line here to show you the result of the optimization where it has placed the carbon and the oxygen atoms. While it's running, let me just take you quickly through a few topics that relate to DFT. So, and I hope that by the time I'm, we're, we're, we're done with these two few slides, we go back to the code and that we see, uh, yes. Uh, sure, no, no worries at all. If anybody is busy, yeah, uh, feel free to go. Um, and I'll put everything online. So let's just cover a few topics until the calculation is finished. So periodic boundary conditions. What's, what's periodic boundary conditions? Periodic boundary conditions means that I have a crystal and the DFT calculation is going to treat the crystal as being periodic in a given number of uh, dimensions. Let me actually show you an example. So that's actually um, a set of uh, six layers of phosphorine. It's a project that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm playing with. 
So this six layers of phosphorine, you see here this big, um, this big um, uh, rectangle here, that's just the unit cell. The unit cell include, that includes six layers of phosphorine, unit cells. Now, let me show you how the periodic boundary conditions work here, apply. So that's just the unit cell of phosphorine, right? The periodicity here can be in two dimensions, can be in this direction and in that direction along with B. You see here, this is the B axis and that's the A axis. So by periodicity, I mean that if I put five here, five there, DFT is seeing that this thin or this narrow unit cell of six layered phosphorine, as if it's an infinitely wide six layered phosphorine layer or six layers of phosphorine. So if I ask the software to give me five by five replication of this unit cell, it gives me the five by five. If I ask 50 by 50, it will give me 50 by 50. What DFT sees is an infinitely by infinity. DFT considers that this unit cell is uh, surrounded by a lot of unit cell, an infinitely large number of unit cells that are exactly same as it is. That's, that's what periodic boundary conditions, I mean, roughly mean, okay? Let's just go back here. Some structures have periodic boundary conditions in a different number of dimensions, like a carbon nanotube. Its repeated unit cell is along one dimension, right? That's why it's just a linear structure, a carbon nanotube or a nanowire. So we say it's a one-dimensional periodic. Graphene is a layer, right? It could be, it, it's considered in DFT as an infinitely uh, large sheet. So it's two-dimensionally periodic. A platinum crystal structure is three-dimensional periodic. In GPAL, one of the cool things about GPAL, and we will be dealing more with, the, uh, more with this stuff in the upcoming uh, tutorials, is that you can actually set the periodicity of your crystals. So if I wanna set the periodicity, I need to create a GPAL object and I set using this PVC attribute next to the XC equal, uh, so that, that's gonna be not in the GPAL, it's in, it's in the atoms. So in the atoms, I add this attribute here, PVC equals 100. So 100 means I'm switching on periodicity along the X axis switching it off along the Y axis and off along the Z axis. And that's a typical structure for, let's say a carbon nanotube or a zinc oxide nanowire. Now, exchange correlation. Uh, exchange correlation is, uh, is, uh, is what made DFT uh, a nice approximation for the Schrodinger equation. DFT approximates the Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation, I imagine it as a large elephant. It's huge, it's very complex, right? It's really hard to deal with this, you know, the, the, that elephant. DFT claims that it has a very simple set of equations, okay, that can approximate, so this mouse, we can consider it as DFT. It approximates that large elephant here, the Schrodinger equation. So that mouse says, hey, I am as big as you are. It's only a matter of having a, a, an accurate black box of exchange correlation here so that I am really equal to you. So, I mean, you consider me as equal to you, you big elephant, as long as I have a, a nice, uh, um, nicely accurate exchange correlation here. Exchange correlation is, let's say, it's like a plugin that you put on your DFT to make it more accurate. Ah, thanks, Simonti. So it's a way to make your DFT equations more accurate. Now, the truth about DFT is that there is a gazillion number of possible uh, exchange correlation approximations, large number of them. It's actually one of the most active field of research in density functional theory, coming up with a reasonably accurate exchange correlation uh, potential to add as a plugin to your DFT. One of the biggest research topics in DFT. But some of them, like for example, that one here I wanna show you here, uh, PVE, that the, the PVE exchange correlation potential has been shown to be accurate for a very large range of systems. 
it's not just accurate, it's actually very efficient in terms of computa you know, computational efficiency. It's very efficient. It runs pretty quickly. So let me show you where the PBE came from. You see uh, Pedro, Perdu, Burke, Erznov, these three guys, the initials of the names, PBE, paper published in Physical Review Letters, 1996. You see how many citations they got, it's amazing, All right? So it's one of the most cited papers in physics, actually in, 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 in the world <laughs> of academic research, I guess, one of the most cited, I don't know if, I'm not, I'm not aware of a paper that's cited more than that, to be honest, but maybe there are, but this is a really large staggering number. So this paper is the origin of the PVE that we have already used. You know what? That's what we did. This is the PVE that's coming from that paper. Okay, so um, let's now look at our carbon dioxide. Oh yes, it finished. The, and uh, these are the bands. These are the eigenvalues of your carbon dioxide. I'm gonna go more into details about carbon dioxide, eigenvalues and all that next tutorial. But for now, let me just show you what I wanted to show you, the distance. Initially, the carbon oxygen distance was one, remember? Now it is 1.17, so it's actually closer to the experimental value. Okay, let's uh, just uh, try to wrap this up. So yeah, so exchange correlation, and I showed you that paper here. And that's all for today. I hope that wasn't a bit, a bit too much. Um, of a dose <laughs> of DFT, and I hope um, that this has given you some motivation, you know, to uh, start a, a little bit of DFT uh, projects on your own, um, you know, to learn a bit of DFT on your own as well. I'm gonna do my best, you know, to continue these uh, tutorials, cover more DFT topics, but it's time for questions. Anyone has any questions? Uh, thanks, Rohit. Any, any questions, anyone? Absolutely, Mubashir. So uh, what I'm gonna be doing once this, uh, once this is uh, finished, uh, I will upload, just like I did for the DFT tutorial, uh, I'm gonna upload it and I'm gonna put it actually on YouTube. Uh, no worries, Patrick. Thanks, thanks everyone. Okay guys, so uh, that's it for today. Really happy to have you here and I'll see you soon. No worries, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye all.